Mission out of the way. We're going to finish up a series tonight. Glad you guys have joined us for the third and final part as we've been going through and looking at the book of Jude. We're going to close it out tonight. This series has been called Contend. We've been talking about fighting for our faith and how Jude told us that there were going to be times that were going to come. He was talking to people in his day and age, in the Bible age, but so much of it is still relevant to you and to me. The fact that there are things that are coming, there are things that are happening that we have to be careful of, so we have to contend for the faith. So I'm not going to go through the last two weeks all in total. You can actually find all of that online and go back and watch it if you missed anything, uh, if you care to, but I will give a brief kind of recap if that's okay. Up to this point, we talked about how Jude established the need for the readers of that book to contend earnestly for the faith, and we kind of defined that and talked about it. Contend is an action. It means to fight. It means to conflict for, to to try to pursue something. We talked about how it's like fighters. We see that word contender in boxing and MMA and different types of of uh, events like that where people are trying to to fight, they're trying to win something, they're trying to gain something. And he gave us some reminders in the first half. He said we have to contend earnestly for the faith and he reminded us if we don't that there is a danger of us walking out of the faith and for those who end up out of the faith there is a judgment that is to come. And that's not too exciting, as we've said. It doesn't make us want to clap and run and shout, but it's real and it's there, and we have to be mindful of the danger that's coming. And he also gave us a, a, some some examples of how we know this is to be. We talked about that. The children of Israel, how many times did... They were God's chosen people. They literally were set apart by God. He had His hand on them literally. And how many times did we see them go up and down, up and down, walk out of the faith, disobey when they thought they had everything figured out, and God allowed them to go right back into captivity? We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, how their evil brought condemnation, it brought fire. We talked about the fallen angels that the Bible talks about who stepped out of their dominion and the eternal damnation they're going to face by God. He also gave us a vivid depiction of the ungodly men who have crept in unnoticed, the people who have stepped into the kingdom of God, people who have crept into the church with ulterior motives meant to try to lead us astray from the kingdom of God. They're talking about people who speak evil of things they don't know anything about. Remember, it's talking about that. There's just some people who spew out and talk. They just like to open their mouth. They just like to say things. In our social media generation, everybody thinks that their opinion is important and we need to make sure that everyone knows exactly how I feel about everything, even if we don't know anything. I know that's too hard for me to bring up right now. I'm sorry. Talked about the people who are rebellious and who grumble and who complain and who murmur and the people who are manipulating and are flattering, trying to gain attention. The people who walk according to the lusts of their flesh and the lust of this world. The people who use the name of God and use the, the, the temple of God to try to build their own kingdom and try to gain popularity more than they are trying to gain prominence in the kingdom or, or make God's name famous. So that's where we've been so far. Not again, the most exciting, rambunctious, running and shouting type of sermon, but it it's an important warning for us to keep our eyes open because... Even today, even in, especially today in the church, if we're not careful, our eyes can start fleeting after the wrong things. We can start following the wrong people. We can start listening and allowing the wrong voices to infiltrate our minds and infiltrate our spirits. And before long, we have walked away from where God wants us to be. So at this point, we're going to start in verse 17 of Jude tonight. And Jude is going to provide us a series of exhortations designed to make sure that we can stand strong. We talked about why it's important that there's an enemy out there, and we've established that, but now specifically tonight, we're gonna, he's gonna lay out a list of things that, that we can do to make sure that we guard our hearts, that we can guard our spirits, that we can make sure that we are contending. If you want to look at it from that analogy of a fight, he began by explaining the rules of fighting in the first section that we went over two weeks ago. Last week, you could say he kind of gave us a, a scouting report on the opponent. He kind of told us who it is that we're battling, what are the, the things that we're going to see. Well, tonight is sort of the actual game plan. Does this make sense? Am I, am I making sense? I ain't lost anybody. Tonight is the game plan where we're going to go through some specifics on what it is we can do to be sure that we are contending for the faith. 
So, let's look here in verse 17 and start. But you beloved. Now, I'm going to stop right away. I know you're like, well, we didn't get through three words. But let's make sure we understand this. He is talking to people who are beloved. That means he's talking to people he loves. Now, literally within the Scripture, he's talking to the people of God whom he loves. The people who are in the kingdom of God. This is very common. Paul called people beloved. Peter, you read First and Second Peter, he called people beloved. The writer of Hebrews, he called people beloved. How many of you are glad that we're loved? He's talking to you and me. We can, we're a part of that group too. So I can stop before we get any farther into this deep thing. Some of you may just need to hear this. You are loved. Maybe you had a rough week where it seemed like the world smacked you in the face and you don't feel like there's anybody. You don't even know if your husband loves you, your kids, they acting crazy. They don't know if they even love you. You came to church, maybe God loves me, I don't know. I'm telling you, you are loved. I'm telling you, I love you. So you're loved by me, you're loved by God, amen? How many of you are glad of that? So he's talking to us. We're beloved. We're part of the kingdom. We were loved so much that God gave his son to die on the cross for us. Isn't that powerful? So he's, he's telling them, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's break that down. Remember the words which were spoken. The first step in your battle is you better remember the words that were spoken before. Remember what has been spoken. Two powerful things here, if you'll notice. You need to remember who it is that's speaking. These are being spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jude is saying this. The scriptures that we're following, the words that we're reading, they weren't just written by some smart people. They weren't just written by some random Joes who who decided to start a blog one day back on some scrolls back in the Bible days. These were people who literally, actually hung out, walked, talked, followed, ate with, slept beside, traveled with Jesus Christ Himself. And not only were these the people who were with Him and witnessed all of His miracles and witnessed all of His sufferings and witnessed all of His greatness and received and was imparted with all that wisdom, but Jesus said Himself that those who I send... They're going in my name. John 13 and 20 says this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So if you are being receiving the apostles, when you're reading the apostles' doctrine, as Acts 2 said, continuing in the apostles' doctrine, when you're doing that, you're receiving Jesus. I think it's important for us to understand. I I hate to go too far here because I'm speaking from this pulpit and I don't want you to think I'm trying to pump up anything up here, but it's important for us to understand and respect people who God has sent to give the gospel, to speak the word, who, who preach and divide the word. Why? Because they've been sent. It's important not to Take those things lightly. And he's telling us this in the Bible. Remember who is speaking these words. These aren't just false words. This isn't like a book that I can usually give my English students day in and day out. Maybe a fourth of them are going to read it. The rest of them are going to ball it up. I don't care about this. It was written too long ago. The Bible isn't treated that way, right? The Bible is words of life. This was written by people who were with and inspired by the Spirit. So remember who spoke them. These were the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were duly appointed and sent out by Him Himself, by Jesus Himself. So not only do we need to remember who spoke them, but we obviously have to remember what they spoke. Remember the words which were spoken before. It is important for us to remember what it is they said. Look at the next verse, verse 18. Remember what they said, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last day who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. I kind of talked about this. Remember the fact that there are going to be people who are going to present themselves and claim to be coming in the name of Jesus Christ who are not representing Jesus Christ. There are people who are going to come in His name and present doctrine that they'll want you to believe is true that is not true. But here's the thing. A lot of people get up in a roar about it. You talk to people who maybe have left the church and forsaken, and, and what's one of the number one things that you hear? Oh, I'm not going there. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. They didn't mean what they said. They weren't living it. But here's the thing. 
remember that we knew that this was going to happen. This isn't a surprise. They told us in the last days it was a prophecy that's fulfilled. There are going to come people who are mockers. They're going to walk according to their own ungodly lust. So yes, while we should recognize it and while we should understand there are going to be people who are in the kingdom of God who are not doing things the right way, we have to also remember that it's not a surprise. We were warned. You all listening to me? It's kind of like those of you who have kids. You tell them something over and over again, and then you know they act like they don't care and listen, and then they come back to you. Hey, I didn't know this. You know, I'm, I'm a teacher. I deal with kids. I know how it is. We just had an exam last week. They sit down. I didn't know this was going to be on the test. Well, that was, you know, what we did that day before when I was given that review and told you literally what was going to be on the test, right? Sometimes we as Christians, I think we get up in arms. We forget, but we've been warned here in the Word that there are going to be these things that happen. And so when we're warned, God expects us, I think, to heed His warnings. He's like a fa- He's our Father. And so when our Father warns sons of something, He wants them to heed and remember those words. Are you all with me? I ain't lost anybody yet. If you're with me, say yeah. All right. Again, I'm sorry to, to do that to you. I just need to make sure we're still good. All right. So basically, that's what he said. For us today, we have to remember what they wrote. So what does this mean? How can we take this and and apply it to our lives? Well, obviously, it means that there is an importance in studying and knowing and remembering the Word of God. It's important for us to, to have it taught to us, to have it divided before us so it's being imparted into our spirits. But guess what? It's also important for us to take time to dig into the Word ourselves and to make sure that we keep it on our hearts. Look at verse... 19. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. So talking about these people who are going to come, these apostates, these evil false teachers that are going to infiltrate the church and try to lead people astray toward a doctrine that's not of God, to try to lead people to a more of, of selfishness. When I say false doctrine, again, we taught some of this the last few weeks, but let me make sure I'm a little clear. I'm talking about people who promote a kingdom of themselves, who, who preach a kingdom that says, you know, this is all about you getting rich and getting as much as you can and, and, and you living your best life now and never talk about the fact that we're meant to be a part of building the kingdom of God and pointing glory to Jesus. Is that everyone with me? You make sense? That's what he's talking about. These people are causing divisions. These are the type of people who will try to tell you, man, they don't treat you right at that church. If they treated you right, you'd be in a better position. They'd give you more attention. They may pass you out a check every now and then. Anybody listening? I know this is not what we wanted to hear, but this is the type of thing that happens. Oh, they don't, man, they don't care about you. They didn't call you last week when you weren't there, and they don't care about you, man. They didn't give you any kind of a special when that happened in your life. I'm not speaking anything real. That don't happen here. I'm thankful for that. But I'm just telling you, that's what happens in the body of Christ. People start getting kind of bitter and upset. There's cause and division. And there's people that will do that because they want to kind of build a following. They want to feel important. Those people, look what it says. They do not have the Spirit. There's no Spirit of God that's leading them. There's no Spirit of God on the inside of them that's leading them into all truth. But notice the next verse. But you, beloved, there's that word again. I love that word, beloved. You are not like those. You should build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Let's talk about that. Building up. Build yourselves. Again, we alluded to some of this a few weeks ago, but I'm going to hit some of this again. That word build up, you know what it suggests when I'm talking about building up? Growing. It means that you need to grow. And notice it says building yourselves. There's some responsibility there that we have in our growth. Not that we can do it all on our own, but there is a personal responsibility that we have in growing. I hate to keep using teacher metaphors, but they seem to work with this particular section. One thing when I'm talking with kids, and this is report card week, and this is that time where we have these serious chats with kids and their parents who are finally starting to realize what's going on, and we always have these these chats, and they want to know, hey, what, what what's going on? Why are my kids' grades looking this way, or why is this happening? And there's always the part of the, the conversation. We have to discuss, okay, so what are some things I, as your teacher, can do to help you? That's important. I have a big role in that. But I can be, I always say this analogy, I could be like the greatest mixture of like Fred Rogers 
and Barney and be the greatest wisdom educator in the world. But if there's never a moment where you, the student, wants to gain the information, what's going to happen? Nothing. I'm making sense? Guess what? We as Christians, we have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. He's put us in places where we can gain knowledge and we can grow in the knowledge of Him. But if we decide that I don't want to grow, I don't want to know anything else, if we just become passive Christians who come sit on the chair uh, every other week and we just kind of sit back and hope something passively will catch our ear while we're kind of snoozing during the sermon, you're not going to grow. Jesus Himself could sit here and talk to you. And if you decided that you didn't want to hear, guess what? It's not going to happen. It's important for us to understand this. It is not enough for us to just lay down one level of knowledge and understanding. We have to continue to build upon it. It's what pastors has been preaching the last few weeks. We can't just get saved and allow our our, our sins to be cleansed and let that be it. That's great. I'm glad. We all, we want everyone saved. We want you to go to heaven, but that's not the end of our spiritual life. That's just the beginning. There's a foundation that God wants to use there and build upon there. He wants to grow each and every one of us into soldiers in His army. He wants to grow us in the people who are, who are working in His kingdom. So we have to continue to build upon the knowledge, as Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18. We're to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we, therefore, need to take advantage of opportunities to study and learn. I am so encouraged when I see people like you joining us here on Wednesday night. Not because I'm talking. That has nothing to do with it. I am, though I am glad of that. I am glad that you're here because it shows that you're taking an opportunity to learn. You're taking an opportunity to grow. Amen? This is an opportunity for you to hear something. Holy Spirit may speak one nugget out of this. There may be one sentence that's said in this whole night, and it's something that attaches to your spirit and takes you to a different level. That's what we as Christians must do. Take advantage of the opportunities we have to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So to build up yourselves, again, I'm going to say it again, it's hard. I don't even want to hear myself say it, I'll be honest. But it takes personal responsibility. I don't want to go waxing poetic on a society that we have today where it's so easy to blame everything on everyone else, right? But a lot of times, even in the body of Christ, when we're not and where we want to be spiritually, who's the first person we want to blame? Man, if that preacher would preach a little bit, I might not be in this mess. Man, if that, those people on TV I try to watch and listen to, man, if they preach something good, maybe I'd be out of this. Listen, to build yourselves up suggests some personal responsibility. Listen, God's there to encourage you. God's there to bless and to touch and to speak to your heart. You have family around you that loves you. Man, if you're part of here at all seasons, you have a body that is full of loving believers. We're here to encourage you. We want to find a way to plug in with you and help you to, to grow and to become the person that God wants you to be. But at, at the end of the day, all of us, and I'll quit saying you because it sounds like I'm pointing the finger, us, we have to accept personal responsibility and make effort in order to grow. Amen? Now notice what we're growing to. We're building up your most holy faith. This is that faith that once believed. It's the, it's the, the precept, the foundation of our doctrine. It's that thing that we all believe in. It's that thing that we all stand strong in. It's the body of doctrine in which our personal faith is to rest. It's that body of doctrine which has been revealed one time for all times, which of course pertains to what our Lord Jesus Christ did when He took our sins upon Him on the cross and laid down His life and then rose from the dead victorious with the keys of death, hell, and grave, victorious over sin forevermore. Amen? That's what we have to build up. We have to remember the fact that Jesus is the answer, that He gave His life for us. In Him we have salvation, we have hope, we have being. So we have to continue to build up that faith. So these first two exhortations He's making, it, 
again, kind of goes back to Acts 2, what they did at the early church when after the Holy Spirit had descended. They, they, they gathered together and they fellowshiped and they broke bread together and they continued with the apostles' doctrine, meaning they continued to talk and to rest in the fact that Jesus had given them victory. But listen, Bible study alone will not help or, or will not will not do it. Bible is important. It's a foundation. It's the first thing he said. But notice what it says here. Building up your most holy faith. Look at this next phrase. It's in the same sentence. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Prayer is the necessary complement to the Word. If you want to think about it like this, if I'm going to contend, if I'm going to be in a fight, and I'm not the best to show you this because I'm not some fighter, but obviously the most important part of a fight is your ground game. If you watch boxing, it's all about footwork, right? Anybody know with me? It's how, how quick your feet can move because you have to make decisions quickly. But I'm going to tell you this, if you get off balance and you're only on one leg, you're done. If you watch MMA, that's a reason why a lot of times when they're feeling each other out and they're beginning, one of the ways they start is with leg kicks. They start kicking the side of the leg. You'll look, and by the end of two rounds, if the fight goes that long, somebody's leg will be swollen, it'll be red, it'll be ugly, because they're just kicking the side of that knee. Why? Because, well, if you don't have an ability to plant, you're not going to be able to throw a good punch. Is that, have I lost anybody? Y'all good? Well, I want you to think about this. We have two legs we stand on in the faith. We have one leg is the Word of God. This leg is prayer. We need the Word of God for God to speak to us, and then we need prayer, us speaking to God. With me? You take one of those legs away and say, man, I know the Bible, but man, I ain't, I ain't talking to God. I don't have time for that. We spend, you know, a lot of time in prayer, and that's good, but we're, we're not balanced on the Word, then we're still going to be off balance. Y'all listening? This, this good? By the Word of God, God speaks to us. By prayer, we speak to God. The Word of God is a source of strength and comfort to us, but then also is prayer. They are the two legs which our spiritual well-being stands upon. So prayer is important. We have to have regular communication with God. We know it's quoted all the time, but Paul said to pray without ceasing, a continual, fervent prayer, a communication with God. Does it mean literally kneeling for 24 hours a day? Obviously no, but constantly as we're going, there has to be communication between us and God. But I want you to notice, and I'm going to really point out this, praying in the Holy Spirit. Pastor has been teaching so incredibly the last few weeks, talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is the Holy Spirit important? Because it gives us that added boost to our prayer life. When we pray in the Spirit, when we allow the Spirit to speak to us and reveal things to us that we didn't know. It's one thing for me to pray in my flesh. What do I mean by that? And this is just my, my way of defining it. But, but you know, it's good to pray in the flesh, but a lot of times when I'm praying just myself, I'm constantly worried about myself. Oh God, help me. Oh God, give me. Oh God, I need. Oh God, do this for me. I mean, that's good. We need to do that. But if our prayer never gets beyond ourselves, I, I personally don't feel our prayer is ever reaching the, the, the greatest point of effectiveness because we're not meant to live for ourselves. But when we pray in the Spirit, the Spirit begins to reveal things to us that we could not even conceive. It may reveal mysteries to us. It may reveal things. Sometimes the Spirit may reveal people. You don't know anything that's going on in their life, but God just puts them on your mind and you begin to pray for them and you begin to intercede for them. And then the Holy Spirit, once you have been baptized with the Spirit and it's churning on the inside of you, it'll begin to speak through you. You have a heavenly language that you're able to communicate to God with. And what does that do? The Bible says that begins to give you strength. It gives you encouragement. It's a refreshing. It's the living water that Jesus talked about that's constantly churning. So when I get down and out, when I'm facing some of these enemies that are in my life or in my face, when I'm facing hard times, when I'm facing bitterness, when I'm facing rage, I can just tap into that running water that I have on the inside of my spirit and I can begin to allow the Holy Spirit to regenerate my heart and no longer do I feel insecure no longer do I feel upset and angry no longer do I feel worried but I feel refreshed and renewed in who I am in Jesus Christ 
That's praying in the Holy Spirit. And Jude says, if you're going to build up your faith, if you're going to make sure that you are where you need to be, you better make sure that you are relying on the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Diligent Bible study and prayer are certainly essential to keep us from falling. But as we continue, there's going to be some more things to do. Let's go to verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. So you need to make sure you have the Bible, that the Word of God is a part of your life, that it's a strong foundation you're building on. You need to make sure that you have a a strong prayer life where you're communicating with God back and forth, where you're praying in the Spirit and allowing God to communicate with you that way. But then we get to another thing. There's another part where we have personal responsibility. Oh no, this isn't fun. Keep yourselves in the love of God. It's the same word, keep, that he used in verse 1 of this chapter, the same word for preserved, to keep. While we're indeed preserved in Jesus Christ, our remaining preserved in Christ is affected by our willing cooperation with God. In other words, I just went through this sort of in week one, and again, don't not trying to go back and, and recap, but let me make sure you understand what we're talking about. I'm not talking about a, a salvation by works or anything like that, okay? But what I'm talking about is the fact that even though we're preserved, I'm sealed by the Spirit, it's up to me to stay in that place. If like we talked about with the children of Israel, I decide to drift off from what the Spirit is saying I need to do, if the Spirit's saying stay in this lane and work here, and I decide I'm going to go over here and do my own thing, I've taken myself out of the will of God. Y'all listening? So when we're saved and the Spirit's working in us and we have accepted the love of God, it's important for us to keep walking in that, but we have to make sure we're keeping ourselves from walking away from it. Keeping ourselves in God's love. Jesus taught that keeping the commandments is the key to abiding in God's love. Said in John, it's how we will be loved by our Father and how we'll be loved by the Son. Think about it. How do we express? We sing songs, and I know it's hard for us to really comprehend. How can I express my love to you, God? And we think about all the words we could say, and we sing songs, talk about there's nothing I could say. But I'll tell you, there is one strong way that we express our love for God. Love is tied to obedience. Love is tied to obedience. Now, obviously, we're parents in here. I'm not saying when our kids disobey, it causes us not to love them anymore. But there is something strong that demonstrates love when our children obey what we say. Right? When our children do as we say, as they do what we ask them to do, when they, when we, even when we don't expect it, when we see that they've, they're getting older and we may not have even asked them to do something, but they're following something we had told them to do weeks ago. I know with my boys, I, Sort of get surprised sometimes. Whoa, I didn't expect you to do that. Great. What does that illustrate? Love. They have love for their father who has at one time told them to do something and commanded them to do something and taught them and modeled and showed them what to do. When they follow those commands, it does something to a father's heart. Are y'all with me? So how can I express my love for the father? It's with my obedience, with me obeying what it is that he has commanded me to do. It's not legalism, so don't start going there. I'm not saying, oh, it's yeah, following all the rules. It's just simply doing what we know the Father would want us to do. Amen? Sometimes, there, you're, I know as you get older, I'm sure as your kids get older, when you see your kids doing something, you may not have even told them to do something, but when they do something that you know would, would be what you would have told them to do, that brings joy to your heart. It's a simple recognition of the importance of doing what God and Christ commands. Observing these commandments are an essential element of recognizing the Lord's authority and keeping the Great Commission. Look, the Great Commission in itself was a command. Go, therefore, and make disciples. It's what He asked us to do. While He's up there building a place, preparing a place for us to go and spend eternity, He simply says, while I'm doing that, you go and make disciples. You go and share the gospel. You go and form relationships. You go and encourage people. Keeping the commandments is what really matters as far as Paul's concerned. He would write about it in 1 Corinthians 7. You can go and look at it. He talked about how important it is to keep the commandments. 
And to be fair, all the commandments fall into two things. We know Jesus told us that. What are the commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you can master those two things, if you can keep yourselves in love, all the other commandments are going to take care of themselves. Amen? It is also the ultimate proof that we love God and His children. Wow. How can I sit here and claim to be a Christian and claim to love Christ and claim to be a part of His kingdom and about what He wants to do, yet you look at my life and you see constant disobedience of all the things in the Bible that He's told me not to do? It's not a good witness, is it? So the Bible study and prayer, those things are vital, but we have to add the actual application of God's Word. That sounds pretty simple, but it's important for us to understand. We can spend all the hours in prayer and read all the Scripture, but then if we go out and live our lives in a complete opposite manner as that commands us to do, it didn't do too much good, did it? We have to be sure we apply the Word to what it is we're doing. Let's look at verse 21. No, we're still there. So keep yourselves in the love of God. Let's look at the next line. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. We almost have, we always have to be looking forward. Did y'all hear me? I'm going to say it again. We always have to be looking where? Forward. Man, so many times I used to, I went through times like this growing up and stuff in my, in my weird imagination. I always kind of had this wish. Again, my weird imagination. Can y'all, can y'all humor me for just a moment? I used to, when I was a kid, I, if I could invent anything in the world, it was going to be like a watch that I could just rewind Paul's time. Anybody ever had thoughts like that? Man, I just wish I could like maybe pause time. And so if I like paused and nothing was happening, everybody was frozen, you just like slap somebody that got on your nerves and then they would never know. You just start time again, their face hurts and nothing happened, right? I, I'm, I'm being fleshly here, but I'm just being, that's the way I used to think when I was a kid, when I was young, man. But I also thought, man, I just wish I could rewind time and go back to when I was a kid, knowing what I knew now, and I could, you know, change this decision and then go here and then go there. And How many people find themselves constantly, constantly, constantly living in the past? I remember God kind of gave me a revelation on that one day when sort of back years ago with Facebook first came up with their timeline concept where it was so you could just kind of scroll back all the way through and it was real easy. And I remember I spent like 20 minutes one day just scrolling all the way back to like 10 years ago when I got on Facebook and, and then I thought about it, man, I just wasted like 20 minutes <laughs> looking at old stuff. And God kind of said, well, that's really what happens when you spend all your time looking backwards. So many people get constantly caught up in all the mistakes that they may have made in the past or get caught up on the things that didn't go their way, disappointments, hurt, maybe even missed opportunities. They look in the past, man, if I'd have just jumped on that, my life would be so different. They get into the Uncle Rico syndrome from Napoleon Dynamite, who's like 45 and didn't get over the fact that he didn't get put in the high school football game. I could throw that football over that mountain if they just put me in. and he, His whole life ruined because he never got over that. It's the same thing when it comes to the kingdom of God. We have to keep looking forward. We can't change the past, amen? We can learn from the past, but we can't change the past. We have to continually look forward. We have to move forward. We have to look forward to the fact that there's a blessed hope and a glorious appearing of our great God and the Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to look forward to the coming of the day of God. Listen, I get nostalgic like anybody else, and I know nostalgia is a big thing now where people like to go back and remember the way it was. And sadly, within the church world, within the kingdom of God, some people have not been able to progress because they just keep waiting for things to go back to the way they used to be when they got saved in the 80s or the 50s or whenever it was. But the, the truth of the matter is, is, is life is moving forward, and we have to understand that the coming of the Lord is nigh. We don't have time. We have to be urgent in the fact that the end is near. Amen? Not the end is near as if we're panicking. The end is near. Jesus is coming. We have to be about His business. We have to look for that new heaven and new earth in which righteousness dwells, especially as it pertains to eternal life and mercy. You see, eternal life is not something we just earn. It was a gift. We didn't earn eternal life. Jesus, through His death, the Lord, the Father, gave it to us. We're saved not by the works of our righteousness, but according to what? Mercy. 
Not a single one of us in here deserved it. Amen? I'll speak for myself. I know I didn't deserve it. But I'm thankful for mercy tonight. I'm thankful that Jesus was willing to go through what He did so somebody like me could have eternal life. It's incredible. We're saved not by works of righteousness, but according to the mercy that we might become heirs according to the hope of the eternal. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day, as Paul prayed. So it's important for us to look forward to mercy. Look forward to the fact that, yeah, things may get dark, things may get dim, things may not go our way. We may have to battle and contend and the fight may get weary, but at the end of the day, there's hope coming. You sort of look at the idea of those fighters who are contending, who are fighting, whether it's in a cage or in a ring. They may get tired in their training. They may get tired in the fight. They, I'm, I'm sure, I would assume, that at some point they get tired of getting punched in the face and kicked in the knee. But they're looking forward to their reward because they know when the bell rings, win or lose, there's a check coming. Right? There's a prize coming. Obviously, if they win, it's probably going to be more than if they lose. But either way, there's something they're looking forward to. I'm here to tell you, that's the reason we have to keep contending. We have to keep fighting. We have to keep looking forward. Because guess what? We have the greatest prize uh, in history. We have the eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Amen? The final exhortation speaks not so much to what we can do to keep ourselves from falling, but what we should do to save others. So all of these things are, are, are ways that we can keep ourselves from falling. Staying in the Word, praying in the Spirit, keeping ourselves in love, loving people and remembering to look for mercy. But notice what it says in verse 22, this last one. And on some, have compassion, making a distinction. But others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. We have to be compassionate. We have to be compassionate. There's that... That, that thing I kept talking about earlier with us uh, building in ourselves, what tends to happen is we can get so self-centered. And I'm saying we, I've been there. God has, has many times sort of did a spiritual slap upside my head to tell me to, you know, get over some of the gripes I have because I'm only looking at myself and what I felt I deserved. But in the kingdom of God, God's wanting us to get the eyes off of ourselves and upon other people. That brings with it what? compassion. We have to have compassion in order to save ourselves. If we don't ever understand the need that we need a Savior, we can't be saved. Does that make sense? If we don't understand the fact we're sinners and we're, we're doomed to, to eternal uh, life in hell, then we, until the Holy Spirit pricks our heart and makes us understand that, we're not going to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Mercy is only going to be shown, in, as James said in James 2, to the merciful if we don't show compassion, God's not going to show compassion to us. But also, we have to show compassion because not only are we in danger, but every person that we come in contact with, our families, our brothers and sisters, the people that are in our neighborhoods, the people we work with, they all need to be saved as well. Compassion is what's needed to move us to action. And compassion is needed to properly handle those who are in danger. If we don't have a compassion, if we don't have a soft spot, if we don't have a love for people and a desire to see people who do not know, if we don't have a desire to see them know and to come into a saving knowledge of Christ, then we're not fully living a life that's full of the Spirit. But notice it also says a need for fear. Now don't get this confused. You're not saying, okay, so we need to go to some haunted houses and get scared. Ooh, no. Fear is in reverence, is in a holy fear. The fact that if we don't have a little bit of holy fear on the inside of us, we begin to become arrogant. We think that we're kind of beyond reproach. We kind of think that, okay, we're okay. We start to be negligent. We can, I can play with this. I'm strong enough in my faith. I'm not going to mess up. I think it's no secret that so many prominent people within the faith find themselves in situations where they morally fail. It's because they lost this fear of what could happen to their souls. They felt that they had reached a place where they had were kind of above everything else. They were beyond reproach, and they kind of lost sight of the fact that they need to continue to contend as well. 
There's no special spiritual level that's like the top of the food chain, and once you get this, you can chill for the rest of your life. We have to have fear lest we be caught up in the same error of the wicked, that we might be motivated also to persuade those in danger of being lost. We have to have a revelation of the fact that there, there are people in our lives, I'm sure people that we love that are not where they need to be with God, and we have to at some time be reminded and have a fear that if they do not come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they will spend eternity in hell. That is a holy fear that we have to live with. Not that it should drive us to anxiety, but it should motivate us. Talk about fight or flight, and y'all heard about that? When we get into a situation, our body sort of goes into this, you know, if there's a dangerous or serious situation, you have that fight or flight reflex. Either I'm going to fight something or I'm going to run away from it. Spiritually, sometimes, I think we have to be motivated to get into the fight. We have to be motivated to get into action. We have to understand the importance of that. So just one quick recap of all of these exhortations. Remember the words that were spoken before. Read the Scriptures. Know the Scriptures. Meditate on the Word of God and understand the importance of that in your life. Build yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in the love of God. Look for the mercy of our Lord and be compassionate with fear. These are the ways that we can hold ourselves from falling. So let me ask you this question real quick. Do we not see that the need for needing these same exhortations ourselves? These weren't just reserved for those in Bible times. We have to be reminded of these today. Let's quickly finish up the chapter. Let's go to 24. Now at this point, Jude takes one final turn. He's given us this exhortation, and now he's entering the part that we'd call a doxology. I know that sounds real churchy and... But basically, now that we've done this, we're going to praise. We're going to give honor to God. Jude is moved to in his epistle with, he's going to end this epistle with a doxology. That word means an expression of praise to God. They're very common in Scripture. Paul ended both the book of Romans and Ephesians in a similar manner. It's usually in two parts. It's an address to who's being praised, God, and then there's going to be the expression of the praise itself. So let's look at it. Verse 24, Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior. Look at who He's talking to. He begins by by letting us know, this is who I'm praising. This is the God whom I'm serving. He says to Him who is able. Everybody say able. We're not just talking about a God that we hope can help us, right? This isn't a wish. This isn't like a last straw. This isn't Superman that we hope will fly by and and see us struggling on the ground. This is the God who is able. He is able to keep you from stumbling. How can we build our faith and how can we live and walk in faith? Because we know that we have a God that will help us and can keep us from stumbling. I don't have to fall back into the same sin over and over and over again. I don't have to fear and worry about falling. Yes, we're going to protect ourselves, but there's a part of me that doesn't have to dread and say, this is going good, but uh, eventually the other shoe is going to drop. Eventually we're going to mess up again. No, we have a God who will help us from stumbling. The emphasis appears to be on His ability to keep us from stumbling. It's not just the occasional sin. To stumble is to fall away completely here. We have a God that has the power and the ability to seal us and reassure us. All of these evil that are out there, all of the things that the enemy is going to try to attack and launch at us to try to keep us away, as long as we keep ourselves in His will and as long as we guard ourselves, God will give us the strength and power to maintain our walk. Amen? But as we've suggested in previous lessons, it says here, our faith must cooperate with God's power if we're going to keep from stumbling. Indeed, we must heed the exhortations given by Jude himself. Remember the words spoken before. What do we just talk about? Building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keeping yourself in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we continue in faith, heeding such exhortations, we know that God is able to keep us from falling. Amen? 
Notice what else it says. To present you faultless before the presence of His glory. God has the ability to present us faultless. Only Him. We can't cleanse ourselves. Amen? The focus here is on God's ability to produce the ultimate goal of redemption. Our ultimate goal. Why did Jesus come? Why did, why did He send His Son? Why did we need this, this atonement? Why do we need this redemption? Is so that on that day, when we stand before God, He doesn't look at us in our flesh, but He looks at a spotless person, a spotless bride is what He's looking for. And how will he be able to see that? By the saving power of God. God's going to be able to present us faultless. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 5.27, we won't have a spot of wrinkle or any such thing. We'll look holy and without blemish. Also, will present us with exceeding joy. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I, that scripture right there is powerful. Because sometimes when we talk about standing before the throne of God, I can't lie, I've, I've been in the kingdom of God for a while, I'll walk with God, I'll, but there's still times when I think about that that I just shake. Because I know even I'm forgiven, but I know what I've done. But notice what it says, God's going to allow us to stand before His throne with what? Exceeding joy. Obviously not talking about the lack of fear or reverence, but I don't have to have terror. I don't have to have anxiety. There's no worry there. There's no depression there. There's no feeling of insecurity there. There's the fact that I know that with joy that God's going to look at me and He's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He's going to see us obedient son. Amen? This will be the condition of those who are so blessed. But let's not discount this fact. We're going to be joyful when God lets us in. But God's going to be just as joyful because He's a Father that's going to be welcoming His children home. Amen? That's going to be such a joyful time. Obviously, if you're not where you need to be, it's going to be a, a, ter a, a time of, of judgment. It's going to be difficult. But I'm thankful to know that if my name is in the book of life, and I'm thankful to know that if I follow after Him and I continue in the faith and I don't walk away from Him, that one day I'm going to have that joyful experience of walking into an eternal reward. It's good. Through His divine providence, God will bring His scheme of redemption to pass. So now look at what it says. Praise be to our God. Look at the next verse, 25. To God, our Savior. At this point, Jude is now ascribing his praise to God. He's told us about Him. I'm about to praise the One who's able to, to bring me into exceeding joy and present me faultless, the one who's going to welcome me in on that day. Yes, I'm talking about my God. I'm talking about my Savior, the one who allowed my sins to be washed away, who alone is wise. His wisdom is seen in His ability to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless. It's not my wisdom, because if I follow after my wisdom all the time, I'm going to do something stupid. Maybe just me in here, but I, if, I, if I'm only relying on my, but I'm thankful I don't have to rely on my knowledge. I have a God who's the, the wisest in all the universe, and through His wisdom, He will help prevent me from stumbling. Amen? Now let's look at the praise. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty. Glory. Comes from that word we just looked at, doxa. It suggests dignity and honor. Our God is honorable. Our God is dignity. He's high on His throne. He's seated high on His throne. There's no one who can look my God in the eye. My God stands before all. Who is like our Lord? Come on, will someone give Him some praise right now? Glory and honor. Majesty. You know what majesty means? It's greatness. Oh my goodness, my God is great. I cannot even try to fathom how big and large and great my God is. They're closely related in concept. They suggest this is worthy of all praise and worship. Jude is saying all glory and majesty. They don't belong to me and they don't belong to any person walking this earth, but all glory and majesty belong to my God. 
dominion. Oh my goodness. I don't have to worry about who's running the show. In a few weeks, we'll all go cast a ballot, and I hope you all do, and, and let the chips fall where they may. And I know it's cliche, but at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything about who has dominion over my life and over this world. Dominion means might, power, and strength. Dominion and power. Power here is referring to authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, strength. My God is in control. It's related in con, they're also related in concept, and the use of these words demonstrate Jude recognizes that it is God who rightly deserves and exercises authority over all. It doesn't matter what man may say to you. It doesn't matter what man may have labeled you. It doesn't matter what threats the enemy may use people here on this earth to try to intimidate us with. None of those people and none of those forces have the dominion and authority over my life. I am who God has said that I am. I am a son of the Most High God, and I will be what He allows me to be. Amen? And notice what he says, both now and forever. Now, right now, whatever you're going through, right now, God has the power and the glory and the majesty and the dominion. But it's not just now, it's forever until the end of the age. So next week, when something blindsides you and you don't know what to do, it doesn't matter because God was the same God that was this week when everything was going good and you were shouting and you were celebrating. Y'all listening to me? It's the same God now and forever. And then he ends it with a single... Amen. Let it be so. And to Him will be the glory, the majesty, the dominion, and the power. And so it will be, despite the efforts of any to turn the grace of our God into, into something that's crude, despite the efforts of all the people who want to make the church and make the kingdom of God a vehicle for their own kingdom and their own fame and their own fortune, despite those people who want to control things and, and, and throw political power around to try to manipulate people, none of those things that, that exist in the church and are there to try to pull people down, none of those things matter because God is still going to have the dominion. God is still going to have the authority and God's still going to be in control of His church. He will have a people as long as they continue to follow after them. Amen? So for us to enjoy the blessedness promised, the faithful, we have to heed this call. We have to remember the word spoken. We have to build ourselves up. We have to pray in the Holy Spirit. We have to keep ourselves in the love of God. We have to look for the mercy of the Lord. And we have to extend compassion and effort to those who are in danger. Only then will it be true that we heeded this exhortation to contend earnestly for the faith. Will you stand with me? As we've done each week through this, I know it's a lot of, a lot of teaching. I've, I've really had fun with this the last three weeks, just being able to dig into this book. I hope God has spoken something to you. and I, I spoke something to you. I hope God revealed something to you. But as we've done at the end of these the last few weeks, I'm going to once again ask you just to sort of close your eyes where you are. And I want you just to begin to listen to the Holy Spirit. I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit as He begins to speak to you. Something that was said tonight. Some part of your life where maybe Holy Spirit will begin to speak and reveal right now. Maybe there's... Maybe you've forsaken, you haven't for take, taken up all the opportunities you could have to feast on the Word of God and remember the words. Or maybe your prayer life, God's saying, I want to spend some time with you. I want to talk with you. I want to, I want to have relationship with you. I need you to set aside some time. Or maybe, maybe God's showing some areas of your life where maybe I haven't been as compassionate. I've sort of been hard and there's people that God's wanted me to care for and there's, there's people I haven't really allowed my soul to have compassion for. Maybe it's the love. Maybe, man, I, I do all the prayer and all the word, but man, this world has just got me so embittered. I just, I just don't feel love for people. Whatever it may be. Maybe you just need to spend some time. Maybe the circumstances of your life, what's been going on with you, Maybe you've lost sight of who God is. In other words, maybe you've spent so much time magnifying a problem and magnifying circumstance that you haven't spent enough time opening your mouth and magnifying the Lord, 
reminding your problem and reminding the enemy of who it is we serve. So tonight, I want us to take some time here, just a few moments here at the end. Will you just where you are? If you want to move around, the altars are open. If you want to come kneel, it's it's perfectly okay to you. If you want to move around the sanctuary, but just for a few moments as they're playing music, and I'm going to pray. But I want you to open your mouth and begin to magnify the Lord. And I want you to allow Holy Spirit to reveal those things that, that He's speaking to you. What are those areas that you need to build upon? What are those areas that you need to build your most holy faith on tonight? Will you do that? Father, we come to you tonight. Father, we first of all, we honor you. We thank you that you have all dominion and all authority. Father, there is no one like our Lord. There is nothing that can stop our Lord. Greater are you that within us than anything that is in this world. You are holy and you are awesome and you're mighty. You have all the power and authority over our lives. There is nothing that man has said or man can do and speak over our lives that can thrive under the power of our God. We worship you tonight. We honor you. We give you praise. We give you glory. No longer will we continue to open our mouths and speak about the problems and the issues that are arising. No longer will we simply glorify the evil that we see. But Father, we glorify you. We speak power. We speak faith. We speak life into our situations tonight. We give you glory. Father, Holy Spirit, right now, as you are moving in this in this room as you're speaking to us. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will prick our hearts and convict us. Father, forgive us, Father, for taking your word for granted, for getting so busy that we do not feast on the word. Father, for taking the opportunities for granted that we have to hear your word taught and to hear your word preached and to hear your word dissected in in ways that we can understand. Father, forgive us for not spending time with you, for not communicating with you. Father, for the times that we spend our, all the time we spend venting to other people or the social media or the people in this world and not spending time talking to you and communicating with you, forgive us and draw us back to a place where we will honor you in those manners. Father, give us a heart of love. God, give us a heart of love and compassion for the lost. Break our hearts for souls, God, that are on the path to hell. Help us to love those people enough to to engage, to share your love with them. Help us to have a compassion and enough for them to protect our witness. Father, sometimes it's so easy to just follow after our own lust and our own flesh, but Father, help us to be willing to consecrate ourselves, even if it's not for ourselves, but Father, it's just to be a witness for someone else. Give us a desire to do that. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts. Move on our lives. Help us to have communion with you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to look forward and not backward. Help us to let go of the past. The enemy will try to remind us of the lost opportunities and all of the past hatred and the past bitterness and all the people that have done us wrong. Father, help us to let go of all of that and to move forward toward the hope that we have in you. Father, help us to continue fighting and to not quit. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And can everybody lift up your voice one more time and give God some praise as we finish here tonight? Thank you, Jesus. God bless you all again. Thank you for being with us tonight. Hope you have a great week. Go give the devil some fits.